earlier I have already discussed that what is the structure, morphology or composition of biological cell. I also discussed that what is the properties of the cells like cellular adaptation like atrophy, hypertrophy, metaplasia, hyperplasia. I also discussed that you know that how protein, what is the you know structure of the protein molecules like amino acids and how these protein molecules are formed and how protein molecules they interact with each other and as well as the collagen, what is the composition of the ECM extracellular matrix and so on. And at the same time I have focused on the part the tissue that bone is an example of a heart tissue. What is the composition of the bone? This is a combination of the mineral phase that is 69 percent. So, 69 percent means that your natural hydroxyapatite or calcium phosphate particles which are in nano size in the bone which is contained 69 weight percent the majority hydroxyapatite as I said. Then you have citrate, carbonate, fluoride and hydroxy ions. Then you have organic phase and organic phase is 22 weight percent and water is your 9 weight percent. Now, among this organic phase your collagen is 90 to 96 weight percent that means majority of the organic phase or most of the organic phase is your collagen. So, that is the reason bone is a composite and this composite is known as collagen hydroxyapatite composite. So, collagen is your organic phase. So, that is like a polymer hydroxyapatite is ceramic phase. In other words, you can describe bone as an unique example of the polymer ceramic composite. Now, hydroxyapatite crystals that form a slender needles in the collagen fiber matrix and the resulting mineral containing fibrils form lamellar sheets. Now, let us see that you know what are the different examples of the bones based on the their shape or size. Now, these typical bones they consist of cortical bone, cancellous bone and bone marrow. So, I think in one of the earlier lectures I have mentioned that cortical bone is the outer surface of the bone which is very hard and strong. Cancellous bone is the porous structure or called trabecular bone. So, porous structure means whenever bone has a porosity that means the properties are inferior compared to the cortical bone. So, property wise cortical bone is stronger compared to the cancellous bone. Then you have the bone marrow, bone marrow is that region or matrix region inside the bone. Now, many times if you say that a patient is having a cancer and people say bone marrow cancer, bone marrow cancer means there are some cells inside the bone marrow region that is proliferating at an abnormal pace. So, cancer is nothing but cell growth or abnormal growth of the a group of cells and which cannot be controlled or which is not natural. Long bones, long bones is typical in tubular in shape and this length of the bone is greater than the breadth. So, if you consider the aspect ratio, aspect ratio of the long bone is much greater than 1 that is the length to the breadth ratio. Some long bones can be actually be short and this consists of a shaft and two enlarged curved ends and shaft of the bone consists of cortical bone surrounding medullary cavity. I think I will show you some slide what is meant by medullary cavity. Now, examples of the long bones are the thigh bone that is called femur, tibia and fibula that is the calf bone, humerus that is the upper arm and radius and ulna is the lower arm. So, you have the femur, tibia and fibula and you have the humerus and you have the radius and ulna. Now, let us see that how this macro structure of the long bone they look like. Now, this is a typical structure of a humerus and if you see that humerus entire structure you have a kind of a cap here and you have the long end also. So, you have a cap that is that you know long compact bone and compact bone is the outer surface of the compact bone and inner surface you have a spongy bone. Spongy bone means cancellous bone. So, cancellous bone has a different name. One is the spongy bone because it has a porous structure. Other name of the cancellous bone is called trabecular bone. So, trabecular bone, spongy bone, cancellous bone they are synonymous. Synonymous means they carry same meaning. Now, cortical bone that is the harder part of the bone. Now, if you take a cross section what you can see in the cross section this is called your actually medullary cavity. Now, through this medullary cavity you have a blood proteins everything they are circulated throughout because blood is the tissue which carry always oxygen to different parts. So, if the blood flow is not there at any part that means oxygen is not transported 
if oxygen is not transported cells will die cells will undergo apoptosis and therefore tissue will not perform its automatic function tissue also will die now epiphysis epiphysis is the end of a long bone and this is the you can see that is that how this long bone end it look like so this is the region i am now so this is the region we are now focusing here and these are different parts that a is the articular cartilage at the end of the bone so this region is that articular cartilage now b is that bone trabecule bone trabecule or the spongy bone now c is the red marrow cavity that is the region that is red marrow cavity and d is the hyaline cartilage now d is again this part so cartilage is another tissue so what it say what it shows here both the outer region and the inner region you have the cartilage tissue and inner part you have that cartilage cancellous bone or the trabecular bone then what is known as the flat bone flat bones is that calvaria and irregular bones are the facial bone so facial bones you can see that is in the skull that is called the facial bones or irregular bones these are examples of the irregular bones and flat bones the name is that called now short bones short bones typically are cuboidal in shape if you remember that how these bones are classified into different types long bones if i can summarize long bones are actually length is much greater than the width that means aspect ratio is much greater than 1 and you have seen that long bones typically consist of cortical bone trabecular bone or spongy bone third one is that bone marrow region or medulla region then you have called flat bones and you have called irregular bones then you have called short bones typically it is cuboidal in shape and it consists of the cortical shell with inner trabecular coat so typically what you see generically bone always contains cortical shell that means that is a hard surface and the hard surface actually protects the internal part of the bone so that is the reason you know that this concept is very natural that is the reason you people always put coatings on the surface coatings means the coatings are typically harder than the substrate so you, whenever you put coatings like titanium nitride coatings or titanium or some other examples then titanium nitride has much higher hardness much better wear resistance than the titanium so that is the reason that why coatings are placed on a soft substrate similarly all the bones they have a cortical shell like outer surface and inner trabecular coat and exist only in wrist and foot so these are like short bones wrist as well as foot they are called short bones and examples are the carpal and tarsal bones so carpal is the any of the eight small bones of the wrist and tarsal bones are the any of the bones of the ankle and the heel in the human being then you have called flat bones they are essentially consists of two plates of cortical bone with porous tissue in between again if you come back to the just the description that i have mentioned to you that is the generic description that you have always the cortical bone which is at the outer surface and inner material is always the cancellous bone so that means the hard surface which is protecting the spongy material or spongy surface and this is generally carved rather than the flat and calvaria is the top of the skull scapula is the shoulder blade so that is also the examples of the flat bones and the ribs are also another examples of the flat bones irregular bone as the name suggests irregular bones means it has a various shapes and it also the composition also depends on bone at it consists of a thin cortical cell surrounding trabecular core again the same principle some hard surface protecting the weaker region that is the trabecular bone and the examples are the facial bones and vertebrae that is the bones of the spine that means that is at your spinal cord or spine these are the examples of the irregular bones irregular means that does not have any specific shape like long bone or flat bone they do not have that kind of specific shape like cuboidal shape that is short bone so irregular bones like it is always it, it, it does not have any specific geometrical shape let's put it that way so that you understand that why it is meant by irregular shape now this is a sketch of the irregular bone structure as you can see that it is really of different very irregular shape and this shaped materials is called irregular shape now this slide actually gives you a table which gives you the range of properties that is typically measured with different parts of the bone like cortical bone cancellous bone enamel and dentin enamel and dentin are the hard tissues of the right enamel is the outer part dentin is the inner part 
Similarly, cortical bone and cancellous bone again is the cortical bone is the surface, cancellous bone is the inner core. Now, first thing I must mention here that you know you, you see all the ranges of values. Now, that means all these bone properties they cannot be characterized by unique value, unique property value. You cannot say elastic modulus of the cortical bone is 10 giga Pascal, because depending on the anatomical location like whether it you are taking from the wrist, whether you are taking from thigh, whether you are taking from leg, your bone property is also different, because the composition of the bone is also different depending on the anatomical location. And if the composition is different, composition means that is a proportion of the collagen and the synthetic and the uh, pro collagen and the natural hydroxyapatite. If this composition varies, you know the composite properties depending uh, depends on critically depends on the ratio of the two phase like alpha beta. If you change the alpha beta ratio, then the composite made of alpha and beta must change. Similar rule is can also be applied to the bone because bone is a polymer ceramic composite. So, if the ratio of the collagen to hydroxyapatite changes, that will also change the bone properties okay and that is what uh, what i am trying to hint here that this bone has a range of the properties be it cortical bone be it natural bone be it enamel or dentin and this range of properties is already is shown here now density of cortical bone is somewhere around 1.8 to 1.2 cancellous bone because its porous in nature is less and density of enamel and dentin is 1.9 or 2.2 now, when you talk about the elastic modulus, cortical bone has a 4 to 27 giga Pascal, cancellous bone is much lower because cancellous bone is a porosity, so the porosity reduces the elastic modulus. You have a compressive strength 10 to 160, cancellous bone can have a lower compressive strength. Then you have enamel has a 13.8 and dentin has a 20 to 84 giga Pascal, which is close to 100 giga Pascal. Okay. Now, as I was describing just now that properties of tissue, some comments here that has been mentioned that properties of tissues vary between individuals and with anatomic locations that is what I just mentioned and between individuals means like you know two persons of the same age can have different bone properties okay that is what I am trying to say. Material properties are significantly affected by the degree of mineralization of the bone degree of mineralization means what is the mineral content means what is the content of the hydroxyapatite in the collagen matrix. So, that is what is meant by degree of mineralization. The density of bone is not an intrinsic property and can ch change with time. For an old person, many times you, 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 the doctors say the bone density is decreasing. Bone density is decreasing means number of bones at the unit length or along a particular length that number of bones is reduced. Why? Because bones will slowly dissolve in the human body. So, that total volume occupied by the bone is reduced and that is called the bone loss and that is why you can see that a aged person or a person of 70 years age, he cannot walk like a 10 years old or 20 years old person, right? Because that walking capability or running capability is reduced because your tissues and the bones cannot perform the same function at the same speed like a what a young person can do because their, their tissue or the bone is losing its capability because of the bone loss or the bone density. Now, some more comments, mineral stores within a bone can change dependent on, on the physiological demand. Mineral stores means again it is a hydroxyapatite content, so it is essentially half. Now, pathological processes can affect the degree of mineralization in normal and healthy bone, the range of bone on bone mineralization is small. What it means? in a normal and healthy person, the bone mineralization that means synthetic or the amount of the hydroxyapatite content varies only within a small window. Let us say total hydroxyapatite content 69 weight percent, so it can vary over 68 to 70 weight percent, not like 60 to 70 weight percent that is a large window. Now, what is pathology? Pathos means like it derives from Greek words like most of the things are derived from Greek words. Pathos means disease and logos means what reason. So, it is the study of the links between the disease and the basic sciences. And what is a disease? A disease is a physical or functional disorder of a normal body systems that places an individual at an increased risk of adverse consequences. So, like 
when you have fever you cannot do your or you cannot perform your normal functions at the same speed like when you are in healthy conditions okay because your tissues will not perform its normal function so because that there must be some functional or physical disorder of the normal body system and disease are typically diagnosed by physicians or other healthcare providers through a combination of tools now whatever you have disease that can you can only get to know only when you do the blood test or urine test or other pathological test okay now let us discuss something on the mechanical response of the human cortical bone now what you do what what has been plotted here stress versus strain now this is a very standard way of plotting the mechanical response of any material let it be metal ceramic polymer etc so that mechanical response is always expressed in the plot of stress versus strain and that is what has been mentioned here now this is a human compact bone means compact means it is like a cortical bone mostly it is a cortical bone now what you can see from this graph this graph you can see if you increase the strain rate strain rate means if you increase the epsilon dot epsilon dot means this is d epsilon by dt and that you can increase by varying the cross head speed suppose you have a tensile specimen you are pulling it with two cross head speed and that cross head speed if you increase or decrease or if you vary then your strain rate also will vary and if you increase the strain rate from 0.001 per second here it is a flat one to 1500 per second what you see you see that curves become much more steeper now how this elastic modulus is calculated elastic modulus is calculated from the slope of the linear part right and from there what you can see when the strain rate is increased so if your epsilon increases then your elastic modulus increases right when epsilon increases your strength also that is sigma t or whatever that is also increases but what decreases that is your ductility that is decreases and how this ductility is measured here ductility is measured by the total strain at failure now total strain at failure is roughly 1% and when you are doing the test at 0.001 then your total strain is 1.6 percent so as you can see that it has a linear region followed by a flat region at the low strain rate similar thing is observed up to the strain rate of 1 per second but when you go to very high strain rate experiments then it becomes flat so then it becomes very steep and the non-linear part or the flat part is also reduced and accordingly your elastic modulus increases your strength increases at the expense of decrease in the ductility that means your strain to failure is significantly reduced compared to the low strain rate test so in other words major message from this plot is that that with increasing strain rate your ductility decreases and then mechanical properties of the mechanical response of the human compact bone is highly sensitive to strain rate okay again mechanical properties of the human compact bone cannot be described by a unique value because that depends on the strain rate as you can see from this particular slide now the question is that why it depends on the strain rate the answer is bone has a complex composition like it has some water molecule about 98 percent you have the majority is the hydroxyapatite that is 69 percent then you have the collagen content around 22 percent or so now it is a polymer ceramic composite now polymers the mechanical response of polymers are time dependent okay and that leads to a time dependent response of the bone because bone essentially contains the polymeric molecules also because for ceramics the mechanical response is not time dependent you do the test at 0.001 per second or you do the test at 1500 per second i don't think the elastic modulus will vary much but for polymers it will vary because polymer essentially the chain micromolecular kind of structure the faster you do that you are you are not giving enough time the chain reorientation to take place during the polymeric mechanical behavior and that explains why bone has a time dependent mechanical response or strain rate dependent mechanical response so this list tells you actually some 
mechanical properties of the cardiovascular tissue. Now, what you can see here, this is the elastic modulus. Now, elastic modulus you have seen from metals and ceramic that elastic modulus is the level of gigapascal, 10 to the power 9 pascal or 10 to the power 9 Newton per meter square. Now, what you see here, aorta for the cow or dog or thoracic aorta for dog or human, it is always around less than 2 mega pascal. So, that means it is extremely soft tissue. Soft tissue means the properties are very much less. So, mega pascal versus giga pascal means it is 3 orders of magnitude lower elastic modulus when you are considering the soft tissue. Now, this is the kind of some other you know complete range of the soft tissues that are mentioned here like arterial wall, it has a maximum strength of around less than 2 mega pascal, maximum strain is 40 to 50 percent elastic modulus is 1 mega pascal, it is so low. Tendons or ligaments, it has a maximum strength of around 200 mega pascal and this maximum strain is 5 to 50. The what you can notice here that in both all these cases, at least these three cases, your maximum strain is less greater or equal to 50 percent. So, it is a large strain of fracture, strain to fracture that is possible. You cannot get this kind of strain to failure in most of the metals or ceramic material. Only in the polymers you can get this type of large strain to fracture. What it means? That means, this most of the soft tissues are largely polymer based. That is why it gives such a large value of the strain to failure. I will be describing the typical uh, protocol that is followed in in vivo implantation as well as histopathological evaluation of biomaterials. So, before I do that, let me remind you that why in vivo testing is required because in vivo testing is critically important or it is very critical for development of clinical devices. For last few lectures, I have described that in vitro test like what is the in vitro biocompatibility assessment or how different in vitro tests like cytotoxicity, genotoxicity, hemocompatibility they can be performed in laboratory scale environments and laboratory scale means that is the in vitro test. However, as I said before, in vitro test cannot replace in vivo test because in the in vitro test you do not see any inflammation and then second thing is that there is no inflammation and there is no immune response. So, because these tests in vitro tests are not carried out inside the animal model, so they cannot show, the, they cannot tell you, in vitro test cannot tell you whether a given biomaterial can cause inflammation when implanted inside the human body or any animal or whether there will be any immune response to this biomaterial. Third important point is that these kind of in vitro cytotoxicity tests, they are always carried out with single cell type. Single cell type means like it may be either fibroblast cells that is connective tissue cell lines or it can be osteoblast cells that is the bone forming cells. They do not involve multiple cell types, but when you put this material inside the in vivo environment, then multiple cell types will come in contact with the biomaterials or in other words, the biomaterials will come in contact with certain tissues and that those tissues can contain multiple cell types. Then fourth point is that there is no tissue remodeling that is possible or that cannot or, or that can be assessed in the in vitro test. Tissue remodeling means that extracellular matrix composition during in vitro tests are largely, uh, uh, largely do not change with time. But inside the in vivo environment, extracellular matrix composition, ECM composition continuously changes because in vivo environment, there is more dynamic changes in pH, there is more dynamic changes in composition of the ECM as well as cell proteins, etcetera. Now, those kind of things you cannot really simulate in the in vitro test. Therefore, in vivo tests are necessary and they provide information on the following aspects like first one interactions of the different cell types. As I mentioned that you know during in vivo implantation that you know a material will uh, come in contact with different cell types. Effects of hormonal factors, those factors cannot be assessed in the in vitro conditions. Interactions with extracellular matrix that is also important things. Interactions with blood bone cells, proteins and molecules. Now, this although you use some serum protein or other kind of proteins in the in vitro test, but you know number of proteins that are experienced or those are exposed to in biomaterial in in vitro test are limited and different biological molecules also biomaterial will come in contact. 
Biometal also will come in contact with the leukocytes or erythrocytes because there will be always blood flow at the any given locations. So, all those things are not possible in the in vitro conditions and therefore, in vivo tests are necessary. So, also let me remind you that what is defined as a biocompatibility that is the ability of a material to perform with an appropriate host response to a specific applications. Appropriate host response means like host here it is that human or animal and so therefore, appropriate host response means that in the implanted area where the material is being implanted those areas should not show any sort of inflammation or any toxicity to be just because that meti synthetic material is implanted in that position. And in a specific application means as I said this biocompatibility is a broad term and that has a different meaning for different applications right. For blood contacting devices it is the hemocompatibility, for bone forming or bone replacement it is the cytotoxicity, tissue formation ability all those things are important. Now, therefore, biomaterials must be biochemically compatible that is the first important point that is biochemically compatible. It should be non toxic and non irritable, non toxic means like you know that cell level or gene level there should not be any toxicity, non irritable means it should not cause any irritation to any part of the body. Third one is that it should be non allergenic and non carcinogenic certainly it should not cause any cancerous effect like you know it should not activate the cancerous cells and once and if the cancerous cells are activated that means, uncontrollable multiplication of cells will take place and which will cause the cancer to spread. Also biomechanically compatible with the surrounding tissues. Now, what it means? It means that every tissue like whether it is a hard tissue and soft tissue you have seen earlier lectures they have a range of properties in terms of elastic modulus in terms of mechanical properties. Now, whenever you are putting the biomaterial for a given applications the tissues that whether it is a bone which will surround that material there should not be large difference between that material and the bone which is in the neighborhood of that material. And if there is a large difference in mechanical properties particularly in terms of elastic modulus then what will happen there is a biological process called aseptic loosening that is that means this biomaterials can be detached from the neighboring heart tissue or bone because if the biomaterials has a larger elastic modulus then biomaterials will carry most of the load. If the bone has a larger elastic modulus then bone will carry most of the load, but there should not be large difference in terms of the elastic modulus. Then last point I have mentioned here the bioadhesive contact must be established between the materials and living tissues. Bioadhesive contact means there should be some kind of biological contact that means when a material is implanted then if it if a capsule tissue is formed around the material implant then that is what is desirable for good in vivo biocompatibility. Now, these implant effects can be simulated in vivo that is dead space can be created by the implant and insoluble particulate materials released by implants. Now, these are the factors which you can easily assess during the in vivo testing. The first one is the dead space created by implant means like Suppose, you have a very long bone structure and the long bone you cut some pieces of the bone then you put your implant. Now, dead space means if the interface is not uniform in interface means that is the space between the implant as well as the natural bone if the interface is not uni not continuous then what will happen? There will be some dead space which will be available where there is neither material nor any natural tissue. Okay. So, that is what is not desirable then in those case there will be problem with the mechanical behavior of the bone. Second thing is that insoluble particulate materials released by implants. Now, insoluble particulate materials means certain particulate materials when it is finer debris particles and so on then they can be easily dissolved in the body fluid or body plasma. But however, the if there is insoluble particulate which is released during the in vivo degradation, in vivo degradation means like inside the implant materials the material also will undergo some kind of degradation and under those conditions they will release some material they will be leaching some materials and if those materials can cause some undesirable toxic effect around the tissues. Then third factor is the interaction of biological factors with implants and fourth one is the mechanical loading experienced by the device. Now, mechanical loading is can be either compression or flexural 
Now, compression means when a body will be at certain part which will be loaded from two opposite directions or flexural means it is like a bending type of situations. Now, this kind of two uh, type of mechanical loading that are generally experienced by the device. Now, it is more kind of uh, explained here that increased local strain due to movement of device with respect to tissue and hyperplasia means increased scar tissue, thicker fibrous encapsulation. You remember that is the cellular adaptation process. Cellular adaptation process means there are four types of cellular adaptation process. One is atrophy that is the decrease in cell size, one is hypertrophy that is increase in cell size, one is hyperplasia that is increase in cell number, one is metaplasia that is the change in cell type like osteoblast to osteoclast transformation that is the called uh, metaplasia. Now, what is mentioned here that you know whenever a biomaterial is implanted inside the body, then the cells which are in the neighborhood in the tissues or the bones, those cells also can can see that some foreign material is implanted at that place. As a result, there will be cells also will experience some kind of uh, different surrounding environment which is not natural. You try to understand what I am saying. So, the cells in the tissues surrounding the biomaterial will see kind of environment where a foreign material is implanted inside the body and which is quite different in terms of composition and in terms of shape compared to the natural tissue or natural bone if it would have been there. So, therefore, there will be cellular adaptation process like those cells which are in the neighborhood, those cells will be undergo some cellular adaptation process and the one cellular adaptation process that I have mentioned is the hyperplasia that is that will increase in the cell number and if it is large number of cells will form then what will happen? They will form kind of scar tissue like you might have heard this word scar. So, many times some scar will appear at the patient at the implanted area or thicker fibrous en encapsulation. Thicker fibrous encapsulation means if this is a implant, so around that implant there will be fi fibrous tissue will be forming and this fibrous tissue will encapsulate the implant from the surrounding natural environment or surrounding bone environment. Now, second point that has been mentioned here that reduction in tissue strain due to implant like if implant takes all load then tissue undergoes atrophy like stress shielding. What it means? As I said that if there is a large mismatch in elastic modulus between the tissue and the implant and if implant has much higher modulus than the tissue then what will happen? Implant will carry most of the load not the tissue and as a result that the tissue will undergo atrophy. Tissue means the tissues which is surrounding the implant will undergo atrophy. Atrophy means decrease in the cell size and if this decrease in cell size continuously take place, then there will be effect called stress shielding will take place. Now, these are the examples of the stress shielding. Now, A is that post operative image that is the called A and there is a B is the image of the same patient after 7 years follow up. Now, this is B. Now, what you see that this is the implant material right and this implant material remain the same, but what is the notice you can see that it is now firmly adhered to this neighboring tissue or neighboring bone, but here it is somewhat you know get detached or loosened because of this aseptic loosening factors that I just mentioned. Now, connective tissue, connective tissue is one of the examples of the fibrous and then that is the cutaneous or subcutaneous sites. Cutaneous or subcutaneous means that is you have the skin, subcutaneous means it is just under the skin that is called subcutaneous region. These sites are chosen to assess the biocompatibility and this type of uh, testing is readily accessible and thickness of fibrous capsule is a measure of biocompatibility. What is mean? And typically these tests are carried out in guinea pig. What I am trying to say here that if you want to do some implant testing or in vivo testing in guinea pig the best possible way is to just put the implant just under the skin. Then you leave the animal for let us say 4 weeks or 6 weeks or 12 weeks. Then at regular interval you take some sample out, then you try to find out that around the implant what is the thickness of the fibrous tissue that has formed. Now, if the fibrous tissue has formed progressively in larger amount, then the material is in vivo biocompatible. But if there is no fibrous tissue formed even after prolonged time of implantation that this material is not in vivo biocompatible. But the remember 
same material can be in vitro biocompatible. As I said in the earlier lectures, that this is the fundamental thing that you must remember that if a material is biocompatible in vitro, there is no guarantee that the same material will be will be found to be biocompatible in vivo. Okay? Now, in case of the vascular implants like blood compatibility of the materials used as a vascular processes. Now, what happens that you know that if you put this implant, you can put this implant as carotid jugular vein or in some other uh, replacement segments of the patches and for this kind of materials, it is not that what is the thickness of the fibrous tissue that is formed that is the indication of the in vivo biocompatibility. Instead, if the material has good bio blood compatibility in vivo, blood compatibility in vivo means in the last lecture I have categorically mentioned that there should not be thrombus formation when the material will be coming in contact with the blood. And even if the thrombus is formed, then this thrombus should be carried away from the material by some continuous blood flow. So, in those two possible scenarios, you can tell the material is blood compatible. Now, this is that guinea pig experiments just I just mentioned. Now, what you see that this is a typical in vivo test applied on guinea pig on extracts of the device and guinea pig test is considered the most sensitive test. Now, what is called extracts? Extracts mean you have a biomaterial which you can ground into very finer particles and those finer particles you can inject them just as a drug delivery thing that is injected in the subcutaneous region. Now, if there is a inflammation like the way it has been mentioned here that this is the area if there is inflammation on the skin that you can clearly take an image and see then this material you cannot say that it is a in vivo biocompatible. Okay? Now, implantation. So, implantation means that is a sample of a predefined shape. Now, predefined shape means it can be of cylindrical cross section, it can be square cross section, it can be rectangular cross section all this typical geometrical shape can be placed in the long bone of a mammal. So, typically all these materials they are implanted into a mammal like rabbit, rat, mouse. Now, as I said that this is the philosophy behind choosing the particular animal model in the in vivo experiment. If a material that you develop for bone replacement or the load bearing bone replacement materials implants, then the first thing you should do the implantation test in rabbit not in the small animal, because small animal means rat or mouse, they are bones, the strength of the bones is not as strong as the way you get the intermediate animal model like in rabbit. So, this load bearing capability or the effectiveness of this material as a load bearing implant that you cannot assess scientifically if you use the rat or mouse model. So, selection of the particular animal model is important in the in vivo test. Other thing that I have mentioned I think couple of lectures back that the larger the animal like rat is a small animal, mouse is similarly small animal, rabbit is little large animal, then goes to dog, sheep and then goes to human. Now, as the size of the animal progressively increases, the complexity of the in vivo environment also continuously increases. Like complexity means the changes in pH, changes in temperature, changes in the number of proteins available, changes in different cell types etcetera, etcetera. In terms of biological complexity also subsequently increases if you go from small animal to intermediate animal to large animal. Okay? So, in, if you choose the intermediate animal model that what we call the rabbit model or rabbit experiments, then it is you can choose, you can say that this material is the in vivo biocompatible in the rabbit model. Again, if a material is successfully found as a in vivo biocompatible in rabbit model, there is again no guarantee that the same material will be in vivo biocompatible in the human being. Unless until you do the test in the human, you cannot safely state that this material can be used in the human body. You understand this is the kind of philosophy of the in vivo test. Now, after some period, the samples and surrounding tissues are examined histopathologically to determine the in vivo response of the materials. That what it means that suppose you implant the materials at a particular area. So, you take the cross section of the material along with the tissues, then you 
do that standard histopathological analysis just to see that whether in the surrounding the material, whether there are cells or tissues that has formed very successfully after a certain period of time. Now, how this is done, it will be more clear in the next couple of slides. Now, first thing is that you have to know that according to the ISO standards or FDA approved uh, uh, protocols, ISO means International Standard Organization, FDA means Federation of Drug Approval. Now, this implantation test are the two types of implant that is that one is a short term and one is a long term and then short term test can be done for up to 3 weeks to 12 weeks and then whereas, long term uh, test implantation test can needs to be done for up to 12 months. Now, why these two tests are necessary, those two types of tests? Now, if you want to screen a certain biomaterial, whether it is in vivo biocompatible, you can do for short term period and long term period. What happens if some materials, some leaching or biodegradation takes place over the long term period, then that cannot be assessed if you do short term period like up to three, months, 3 weeks or 4 weeks or up to 12 weeks. Therefore, if you do the long term test, then you can be more sure that this material is in vivo biocompatible for the long term basis. So, implantation studies also evaluate the potential leachable substances using chronic systemic toxicity and then blood hematology and biochemistry are also performed in many cases. So, as I said the different uh, animal model which can be used or which are used like mice, rats, guinea pig, rabbits. As I said the rabbit model typically used for the kind of materials like ceramic based materials or biopolymer based ceramic composite, those kind of materials rabbit model is used. However, if the material is, uh, poly is entirely polymer based where the mechanical properties is much inferior compared to ceramic based materials, in that case smaller animal models like rats or mice also cannot can be used. Now, implant is first cut into size, sterilized and implanted and then x-ray radiography needs to be carried out and this x-ray radiography means like you have to take that x-ray image just like you know you take x-ray image for that when your leg gets fractured or your hand gets fractured. Similar x-ray image you have to take at the implant site, you have to store it then you have to see after one week this is the x-ray image, after three weeks this is the x-ray image like that you can compare this x-ray image. Okay, this is like you know standard protocols what is defined as that ISO 109936 that is the implant effect now test in the long bone of the rabbits. Now, this is like 1 into 10 millimeter strips of the material that you can that can be cut and sterilized. This is placed in gauge needles, anesthetics applied to the implant site. So, it is like you know every test is done in a OT like operation theater. So, you have to give anesthesia to the local anesthesia to the animal at that site and then 4 test sample and 4 controls of the each composition needs to be implanted in the paralumbar muscle. So, what it means like you have to use the test samples like your materials which are testing at the same time you have to uh, put the control samples also. Now, why control samples is necessary? Control samples means the samples where you already know that is in vivo biocompatible. You understand what I am saying? So, that respect with respect to the control sample, you can now assess whether a given material or the material that you have developed in your laboratory is in vivo biocompatible or not. So, that is why the control sample is necessary and you already have seen that all the in vitro experiments also that is all always positive control or negative control sample is always used. Now, test samples and controls on the opposite sides. That means that if you take one leg of the rabbit, you put your test samples. If you take another leg of the rabbit, then you put your control samples. So, these are like on the opposite legs. Then, short terms, as I said, up to 1 to 12 weeks. Long term, you have to do this tissue response up to 78 weeks. Now, at each interval, now what would be the interval that you will be observing? That depends on whether it is a 1 week, 4 weeks, 8 weeks, 12 weeks, or it will be 1 week, 4 weeks, 12 weeks. Now, this reactive material is typically 2 to 4 millimeter thick. What is reactive material here? That is the just the material and the tissue surrounding just adjacent to the material that is called the reactive material and no visible capsule on the control material and histopathological examination will actually tell you that what is the inflammatory reaction to the implant 
and where there is a cell death around the implant. Now, if there is a cell death around the implant, then what will happen? That the material cannot be used in the real life applications. Now, this actually tells you that how you can qualitatively assess that whether a material or whether two different materials, how good or how bad they are as far as the in vivo biocompatibility is concerned. Now, you see this is your implant materials, this white contrast materials, is a, it is a different shape. What I presume that possibly this material when it was implanted, this was like a perfect geometric shape of a rectangular shape, but these edges actually indicate that irregular edges actually indicate that some part of the material has been leached away during the in vivo implantation. This is the surrounding tissues around the implants and if you see that this is the region where this fibrous capsule has formed around the implant. Now, it is called minimal response. So, the response is not extensive, but a composition similar shaped material of different composition were also placed here and what you can see entire material has been dissolved in vivo. You are left with only the small parts of the material and there is an extensive inflammation reactions around the implanted zone. So, that means this material you cannot use, this material you can accept as the roughly like in vivo biocompatible. Now, you understand that how qualitatively you can assess whether two different materials which one you will choose for the in vivo biocompatibility. This is like you know dental screws which are actually put it inside the you know de as dental restorative applications. Now, I will show you some of the experiments that we recently carried out. Now, these are the material shape typically we used in our experiments. As you can see these are like cylindrical shaped specimen and I know their diameter is around 2 mm diameter. So, it is extremely small size diameter a small size and this is aspect ratio is around 3 to 4 aspect ratio. So, 2 millimeter diameter and 8 millimeter length that is in cylindrical cross section those samples were used in this in vivo experiment. Now, these are the experiments which are going on in rabbit. Now, this is the long bone of the rabbit as I said that this long bone you have to put some holes here these are like three different holes and these holes the moment you drill the holes there will be also blood coming out right through these holes. And you have to put the material here at three holes in one leg. This is one leg that is another leg which you cannot see very clearly. So, one leg you put the rabbit another leg also you put the control specimen. Now, what you do here that after one week this is the x-ray images. Now, what you can see this x-ray images this is your sample you can clearly see your samples right that is your hydroxyapatite, mullite or whatever samples it is. After 4 weeks, you can clearly see the samples here and after 12 weeks, you can see the samples almost of the same size. What it means? That there is no visible in vivo degradation from the samples. If it would have been degraded in the in vivo environment, you cannot see the same 2 mm diameter cylindrical specimen after 12 weeks, okay? because then samples would have gone to half the diameter or half the length whatever it is. Okay. Now, this is one of the way to find out that in vivo degradation. I will also show you before going into more details about the recent results. I will also go through the some of the literature results where people have done several experiments on all different type of materials. Now, titanium based alloys as I mentioned titanium and titanium based alloys they are highly desirable for the stem applications of this total hip joint replacement. Stem means that is the long rod and why titanium is preferred? I said that from the point of view of the corrosion and wear titanium is more corrosion resistant compared to stainless steel stem for example. Now, if you see here that after 4 weeks it, these materials are implanted in an animal model and these are like four different composition one is ti 6 l 4 b that is titanium 6 percent aluminum 4 percent vanadium ti 13 n b 11 zirconium the titanium 13 percent niobium 11 percent zirconium ti 6 l 4 v that is titanium 6 percent aluminum 4 percent vanadium plus hydroxyapatite means hydroxyapatite means this is is in the form of hydroxyapatite coatings 
then you have this ti 13 nb1 zirconium plus hydroxyapatite like you have this same alloy but with hydroxyapatite coatings after 4 weeks and what you see in this ti 13 ibm 11 zirconium plus hydroxyapatite here it does not show much toxicity response and you have this very fibrous tissue forms and you can see there are different cells these are like osteocytes and osteoblast cells but in most of the other cases the same size implant because the implant size were the same in all the cases okay however this is the region this is the region that the material has been dissolved in the in vivo environment that means all three materials you cannot use that well these materials yes you can be considered you can consider it as a in vivo biocompatible Okay, this shows that connective tissue in growth into the composite ceramic at week 4, okay. And this is the fibrous encapsulation of hydroxyl at week 4 and hydroxyl acid bone and bone marrow remodeling at week 8 and composite ceramic new bone formation at week 8. Let us go through one by one. Now, this one actually connective tissue. Now, this connective tissue you can see that after staining, this connective tissue actually is growing inside the hydroxyapatite this entire material is your hydroxyapatite, this entire region is your natural tissue. Now, fibrous encapsulation means as I said that if a material is in vivo biocompatible around the material there will be a fibrous tissue and this fibrous tissue will be formed and they will encapsulate the material from the surrounding natural tissue or bone. The third one is that hydroxyapatite bone growth. Now, this is the bone marrow and this is the cortical bone CT and you can see that there is a nice bone formation even after 8 weeks and this is shown as a new bone formation, new bone or new bone formation at the implanted region. So, hydroxyapatite is well known as an in vivo biocompatible material and this is the proof that yes under the in vivo conditions even after 4 weeks or 8 weeks you can clearly see that new bone formation. So, this is after 14 days or 2 weeks of the implantation on different material like TIC cell 4B, PSHA coatings and DDHA coatings. Now, in all these cases you can see that is the neo bone formation and this is also the region bone formation. Now, TIC cell 4B this is your implants, okay. this is the region that is the where the neo bone has been formed. This is also that another TIC cell 4B and on that there is some coatings, hydroxyapatite coatings is there and this region new bone formation. So, what has been shown here that hydroxyapatite putting the hydroxyapatite coating on this titanium 6 L 4 V also enhances this bone growth or bone formation in vivo. Okay. This is the transmission electron micrographs and this transmission electron micrographs essentially tells you that what happens after implantation for 14 days. So, here the two materials were uh, in we investigated one is a plasma spread hydroxyapatite coating and another one is electrochemically deposited hydroxyapatite coating. So, plasma spread hydroxyapatite coating this one electrochemically deposited is this one. Now, this is your coating structure and this is your mineralized tissues. Mineralized tissues means like these tissues has lot of hydroxyapatite content. Mineral means that is again the inorganic component of the bone that is a hydroxyapatite and this is the mineralized tissues which are formed here and that you can clearly see after the staining. Now, there are several other metallic implants that which are used in the in vivo conditions that is nickel titanium. This is a shape memory alloy nickel titanium and this nickel titanium implant when it is put it for 13 weeks of implantation in a particular animal model. Then what you see here that large number of bone cells and collagen fibrous networks that you can see and a little bulk cell and collagen fibers on uncoated nickel titanium implant. Now, here you can see large number of osteoblast cells and this fibrous network you can see these fibrous networks are essentially collagen fibers. So, both the collagen fibers and osteoblast cells if they are present in the neighborhood that will clearly indicate that you are essentially enhancing the extracellular matrix formation as well as the bone forming cells are activated so that you can have new bone formation. However, if you compare this with this, you can clearly see that when you are do when you do not put in hydroxyapatite coating, then you do not see that well the bone cells, different bone cells as well as this collagen network is also not that much prominent or more visible 
or more extensive like that in the presence of the hydroxyapatite coating. Now, how this bone tissue histopathology that is carried out in real life? Now, you have to first fix the samples in the toxicological lab, then implanted zone are cut using diamond saw. So, using the diamond saw you can cut the implanted zone, then you have to do it for the dehydroxylation using alcohol. So, that means that serial dilution using alcohol you do that, you get rid of that all the water molecules which are absorbed. Then you embed it in resin, so you put it in resin and then you cut the cross section wise using the diamond saw, then you can grind and polish the cross section samples and subsequently you can stain and you can observe them under the microscope. Stain means it is just like etching of the metallic material. Stain means if you do etching in the metallic material, ceramic materials, you can see grain boundaries. Similarly, if you stain that means you can use some particular chemical reagent and those chemical reagent actually will stain certain cells or the extracellular matrix or the actin filaments or the nucleus or the mitochondria. Depending on what kind of stain you used, what concentration of stain you used, you can clearly see those cells and the particular features. So, typically the stains those are used in this histopathological investigation, these stains, these stains are widely used as Stevenel's flu. The Stevenel's flu, it is generally used mostly for this uh, bone tissue straining. And then other strain used for soft tissue is that eosin and hematoxylin. The soft tissue of uh, the soft tissues, these are like different tissues, like these are not like heart tissues or bone cells. For the bone tissue engineering, this is always Stefanel's flu, which is widely used. Now, as I said just few minutes ago, that you know that staining agents is just like etching or etchants in case of the metals. Now, different stain they attack differently chemically distant phases or attack some specific group or site. What it means? It means that like an agent in case of metals and ceramics, they also chemically attack the different grains and then they will reveal the grain boundaries. Similarly, here the stains attack different chemically distant phases like mitochondria has different chemical environment compared to the nucleus per, per se. So, nucleus will stain differently compared to mitochondria or nucleus will stain differently compared to the extracellular matrix or the actin filaments or the cytoskeleton. Because all these phases, although they are bound in the same cell, but they have different chemical composition and accordingly they will be attacked in a different manner by the stains. Now, what is the dehydration, how this dehydration takes place? This dehydration first you have to, you know, use first 70 percent alcohol for 1 to 4 days, 80 percent. 96 percent and 100 percent alcohol for 2 days and then alcohol acetone mixture that is 1 to 1 is to 1 that is for 1 day and 100 finally 100 percent alcohol for 1 day. So, that is the way you can dehydrate or dehydroxylate this entire tissue material interface sample. Now, what are the things normally you should look for when you look this bone tissue samples under the microscope for in this optical microscope or fluorescence microscope or what kind of microscope or ACM. Then you want to see first is the new bone formation, whether that takes place around the implant, that is the number one. Number two, whether there is an inflammation around the implant and number three, whether there is a bones is the osteoconductive and it has the osteoinduction property. Now, some general observation is that during initial period, let us say some may, many times what people have reported in the literature like let us say first after the initial first one week, some kind of inflammation may be observed and that is due to the bone marrow response. But this inflammation should not sustain for 12 weeks or 78 weeks. This will go away as you give more and more time for the animal to heal from that wound. Essentially, whenever you cut and long bone, essentially you are wounding or you are giving some wounds or you are imparting some wounds to the animal. And then every wound healing process biologically will take time. Suppose you get some, you know, <coughs> you, are, you are hurt in this in your leg. So, there will be some blood clotting and everything. So, this blood clotting will not go just one hour, it will take maybe one day. So, similarly, in the animals also, this wound healing process takes place possibly a week or so. And new osteoblast cells, they appear blue in color after staining using Stevenel's flu. And you have to also see that what is the orientation of the osteoblast cells around the implant. Osteoblast cells are not like, you know, epidermidis cell lines, like they are just lined one after other. So, they are like connective tissue cells. So, they are dispersed in the extracellular matrix, but they are dis they are actually there are a lot of distances between these two or three osteoblast cells. 
Now, also you have to see that implant material and the bone interface, that is the new bone form can be observed. And in some cases, some matured bone or direct material, bone material contact also can be observed. This is a clear indication of a good bioactive material. Bioactive material means bioactive in vivo, then this kind of observation you can make. Then matured bone cells appear brown in color. Then if you see that matured osteoblast cells, then you see the different color and haversian canal appear blue in canal. These canals are surrounded by osteoblast cells. Now, what is a haversian canal? Haversian canal is like a more or less like a cylindrical channel like a thing through which nutrients and bloods and foods are supplied to the cell. Marrow protein appear black in color. Now, all this color sequence you have to know that how they will appear in the fluorescent microscope. Then only you will be able to identify the different images. And there is a color contrast in the new bone and natural bone formation also. That is important because how you can see that whether it is a new bone or natural bone. Natural bone means what it has existed before implantation and new bone means what bone formation has taken place after you put the implant at the particular animal site. Now, this is the entire histopathological protocols, you know you ha one has to follow to get to study this kind of in vivo biocompatibility aspect of biomaterial. Now, what it shows here, this is a long bone, okay. as I have described uh, in last lecture, that is a long bone typically has a large aspect ratio like it has a large length to diameter ratio. Now, in the long bone, you are cutting at different region okay? and then you put your implants, this is the red circles, that is the implants you have put in the long bone. And then after that, you take this long bone that you can cut it by the diamond cut, diamond cutting machine. Then you put it in the dehydration that is an alcohol. So that is like serial dil dilution that you uh, that you give the treatment to this bone tissue sample serial dilution. Then you embed it in some kind of PMMA that is polymethyl methacrylate, okay? That is a polymer. Then after you embed, then you cut the cross sections by the diamond shock. And if you cut this cross section in the diamond shaw, then essentially you are seeing that both the implant and the implant bone interface. Then you take a thin section, then you polish it in that standard polishing wheel, and then you do the staining. This staining is done by Stevens blue because of the bone tissue engineering. And if it is for soft tissue engineering, other stains like eosin can be used. Then you can use the fluorescent microscope to observe this, what are the different features of the neighboring bone at the neighborhood of the implant. So, that is the entire protocol for this bone tissue engineering or histopathological response. Now, I will show you some of the results that were obtained for this hydroxapatite mullite composites. Now, these tests were carried out at Tunnel Institute of Medical Science and Technology, that is in Srivandram down south, and that test was done for short term implantation, like up to 12 weeks. Now, after one week, this is the hydroxide 20 percent mullite, because why we have chosen this of particular composition? Because this particular composition demonstrated better combination of mechanical properties and better combination of the in vitro cytotoxicity, bone mineralization, etcetera. So, therefore, we thought that we will do the test only on this hydroxide 20 percent mullite, because when you are doing this in vivo experiments, then you have to also be careful because there is an animal ethical committee or animal welfare committee, you cannot use capital N number of samples and you cannot kill that capital, capital N number of animals in during that any in vivo study. You have to minimize the number of animals that you want to sacrifice because of your scientific study. So, therefore, the selection of a particular material for in vivo test also needs to be made very carefully with some scientific rationale or with some logic. So, therefore, we have only chosen this particular composite and what you see here, this is your implant. Now, around 50 micron that is some tissues are forming and this is also a different, you know, different after doing this stiffness flow, you can see the connective tissues as well as fibroblast cells around the implant materials which is formed. And these are the examples of newborn, this is the newborn trabecule, that is the black arrow. And the newborn trabecule means, that is the trabecular means spongy bone. And that spongy bone structure you can see here, that is like a more like a pore structure. So, as you know, 
the trabecular bone, spongy bone and cancellous bone, they are synonymous words, right? They carry the same meaning. Now, here you can see this is the like more like cancellous bone that forms. So, and this is the new bone that is formed in that and this is the cortical bone and this is the implant side. This is after 4 weeks what you can see here, this is your material, this is your new bone, the, there are some regions where the Habertian canals are there and you have this cortical bone that is your natural bone. So, you have this natural bone, this is the entire interface that is the bone material interface and this is your material. So, that means this material shows good in vivo biocompatibility and you can see here that around this implant zone here and this part you can see that clearly the tissue formation and there are also multiple different cell types which stain differently in the when you use this Stefner's blue. You are seeing some blue colored cells also you can see some differently colored cells here. This shows that you know how this bone material interface they look like in the scanning electron micrograph. If you closely observe then you can see there are some canals here right and these canals are essentially what I call is that Habertian canals and also this interface is continuous. You do not see any gap in the interface or there is any loose part in the interfacial region. This is again some new bone formation and this cortical bone is formed and this is your implant material. Often if your sample preparation is not good then this is a brittle material you are handling you can cause some crack at the interface. These cracks are not necessarily formed because of any in vivo reaction. So, you have to also analyze it carefully because you are handling the ceramic based material which is brittle, you are handling some bone tissue at the interface that is also brittle. So, if your sample preparation is not done with extreme care often you do see some kind of cracks at the interface. This is after 12 weeks and 12 weeks also you can see this is this is the shape of the implant and then from this shape of the implant you can notice that this material does not undergo any in vivo biodegradation process and these are like different cells like these are like osteocytes, osteoblast cells and osteocytes is the white arrow and new bone is the black arrow in different images that is fluorescent images that you see here. This is 12 weeks, this is very good picture, what you can see this is a material, this is your new bone and that appears in different contrast and this is your actually natural bone. Natural bone, again natural bone contains both trabecular bone as well as the cortical bone. Typically the surface, outer surface is cortical bone, inner surface, inner area is the trabecular bone or the spongy bone structure. So, I think I have finished here that is the discussion on the in vivo implantation and then in the next lecture I will start with some of the results that we have got, uh, experimental results that we have uh, got on this hydroxyapatite based different biocomposites and some of the polymer ceramic composites.